Good morning and welcome to another online church service. We're glad that you're tuning in with us today and pray that God would bless you as you spend this time in worship of Him. We begin with a call to worship from Psalm 8. It reads like this. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's bow our heads as we pray. And so, Lord Jesus, we today, who are worshipping you here, recognise your majesty. We have seen your glory, not just in the stars and the heavenly sky or in the glory of your creation, the beauty of your handiwork, but we have seen your majesty, Lord, in the way that you have cared for and looked after us. We realize, Lord, that there is nothing special about us, but you have loved us. There is nothing holy about us, but you have extended to us grace. There is nothing that makes us deserving of your kindness, and yet we have it in abundance. So Lord, we echo the words of the psalmist today. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Because we recognize, Lord Jesus, that your name changes everything. It is by your name that we are healed and forgiven and restored. It is by your name that all power and authority is given. It is your name that we cry out when we are at our lowest and in desperate need of help. It is your name that we shout out to celebrate when the great things of this world happen to us. And so, Lord, we worship and adore you, your glory and your majesty, and pray that you would meet with us as we turn our attention now to your word. This we ask in the powerful, precious and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Would you join in as we sing Man of Sorrows?
son. Then he said, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he had gone through all his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with the citizens there, who assigned him to the fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have eaten the corn cobs and the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses. He said, all those farmhands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants, quick, bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive. Given up for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. All this time his older son was out in the field. When the day's work was done, he came in. As he approached the house, he heard the music and dancing. Calling over one of the house boys, he asked what was going on. He told him, your brother came home. Your father has ordered a feast, barbecued beef, because he has him home safe and sound. The older brother stalked off in an angry sulk and refused to join in. 
His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't listen. The son said, look how many years I've stayed here serving you, never giving you one moment of grief. But have you ever thrown a party for me and my friends? Then the son of yours who has thrown away your money on whores shows up and you go all out with a feast. His father said, son, you don't understand. You're with me all the time and everything that is mine is yours. But this is a wonderful time and we had to celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. So the story that we have read today is a very well-known one. In the Bible, it is entitled The Prodigal Son or The Lost Son. And we know the story quite well. It's good to remember that it is a parable, a story that Jesus tells to highlight a certain truth. We know how the story goes. The younger brother demands his inheritance. He goes and blows it all and quickly before coming to his senses and going back to his father and begging for forgiveness. Now that word prodigal in the title is an interesting one and it is where we begin our study today. That word prodigal has this meaning in the dictionary. It's an adjective for spending money or using resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. It is having or giving Something on a lavish scale. Prodigal. Wastefully extravagant. Those are phrases that describe the younger son perfectly. He wasted all his money on extravagant and lavish living. But what I find in the story is that the subject of the story, the main character, is not the younger son. Neither is it the older son. They both have roles to play in the parable that Jesus tells. But the subject, the main character of the story, is in fact the father. You know, the whole story begins with these words. There was a man who had two sons. The story is about him. It is about what he does and what he says. And so the story begins with the younger son approaching the main character, the father, and asking for his inheritance. Now to us, this comes across as very rude, perhaps even presumptuous. But for the ancient Mediterranean listeners, for those who would have heard this story firsthand from Jesus, this kind of request was unheard of. No son would dare to do this to his father. You see, the way inheritance worked back then was that the older son was entitled to two-thirds of the estate. One-third was entitled to the younger son. But for the younger son to ask for his inheritance now, before his father had died, he would essentially be saying, I want you dead. I prefer stuff over you. It shows that the son sees his father as a means to an end. There is no relationship, no respect, no love for his father. It is so rude, so disrespectful, so arrogant that it had never been seen or done before. I mean, this story would have been shocking to the listeners, to those hearing Jesus' story. Now, the response from any self-respecting father in a situation like this would have been to drive his son out of the house, to beat him, to discard him as a member of the family. But the father in this story doesn't do that. He divides his property. He literally tears himself apart. He says goodbye to his land and his stuff, and he gives it in cash to his son unheard of in the ancient world. This father does what his son asks for. And can you imagine how much that would have stung the heart of the father? This is a story of being rejected, of having all your love thrown back in your face. What would you do in a situation like that? 
where your love or your affection had been so completely rejected by someone else. The son takes the cash and leaves home, and he does just what we expect him to. He squanders all his wealth on reckless and wasteful living. In no time at all, he's run out of cash, run out of friends, and run out of favors. With no money left and no one to turn to, he ends up finding a job looking for pigs. Now the irony in the story is not lost on me. Jesus, a Jewish man, telling a group of Jewish listeners a story about a man who has nowhere else to turn to, so he goes to get a job at a pig farm. And that would have been considered the worst job possible. So degrading. Oh, how far the sun has fallen. In this hole of self-pity, the man begins to think honestly about himself. And in his desperation, realizing the error of his ways, he decides he's going to go back home. He knows in his heart of hearts that he can't go back and reclaim his title as son of the father. He's already lost that right. But he, he reckons maybe if he repents, maybe if he says he is sorry, his father will hire him, take him on as a worker on the farm. After all, even his father's workers live better off than he is living right now. So he heads home hoping to find his dad in a good mood. Now the listeners would have been thinking, good, you have gotten exactly what you deserved, you naughty younger son. The listeners also would have expected that there would be no way on earth that the father would take his son back. He'll be chased away, maybe even beaten. But this father, the subject of this story, is no ordinary Mediterranean father. The father does five things here that would have been considered outrageous in the ancient Middle Eastern world. The first thing his father does is he runs. The text tells us that when the son is seen far off by the father, the father sets off running out to meet him. It's an amazing thing because ancient respected men, noblemen with their flowing robes, would never ever run. You see, to lift up your robe when running would expose your ankles, and that would be something that would bring humiliation upon yourself. You know, Aristotle, the famous Greek philosopher, said, Great men never run in public. Children run, mothers run after children, but regal fathers do not. But this father runs. He doesn't care what people think about him. He has to go and meet the son who has been lost. The second thing that his father does is he kisses his son. Can you picture it? They're embracing eye to eye, shoulder to shoulder. In his mind, the son had pictured himself coming home and groveling, crawling at his father's feet, humbling himself. Maybe first he'd kiss his father's hand, and then he'd kiss his father's feet. But the dad won't let him. He puts his arms around his son, he kisses him, and he embraces him. The son doesn't have a chance to bend down or to stoop. All he can do is stand there and accept the love of the father. You know, the son has this whole speech planned. Father, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. I'm deeply sorry. I've wasted your inheritance. Please, could you forgive me and take me back, not just as your son, but even just as a hired servant. But the father interrupts him, doesn't even let the son get his words out. He calls over the servants to bring robes. Son, you're not going to earn your way back into this family. I am bringing you in right now, just as you are. And finally, the father says, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Not just a goat, not just a sheep, not a chicken, but the fattened calf. Now, why the calf? The calf was a precious and valuable piece of property. Not everyone even had a calf. And if you did, you would never waste it or kill it flippantly. 
In fact, back then, people ate meat so very rarely that it was only used for special feasts and celebrations. And the calf was perhaps the most expensive meat possible, only for the most special of occasions. And so picture this, that the father, who has already given the son so much, is prepared to give even more for him, the son that he loves. Now the older son is obviously not happy about this. The older son comes in from the fields, he has the commotion of the party going on inside, he hears that his brother has, re has returned, and he is angry. He is so frustrated. His brother just seems to keep on getting everything from the father. The son refuses to join the party, which in itself would have been an incredible insult to the father. A humiliation to the father again. The whole village is inside at that party. And the older son refuses to join, even after the father specifically goes out to ask him to join. It shows that for this father, both of his sons have an incredible disrespect of him. In this instance, the heart of the older son is also far away from the father, perhaps just as much as the younger son. He says to the father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed you, yet you never even gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. He says to you, the older son is saying, father, how dare you spend our wealth like this? We see that the older son is also looking for stuff. He's not in it for love of the father. He wants what he can get as well. And now he too causes a scene by not going into the party. But again, notice how the father responds to her son who has shamed him. He goes out to meet with his son. He makes the first move. He shows his love and his desire to have both his sons with him and celebrating with him. His message is essentially, son, I still want you inside with me. And that is where the story ends. Jesus tells this parable and ends it purposefully on this cliffhanger. Does the older son go inside? Does he accept the offer? Or does he remain outside, far away from the father, revealing that his heart is just as bad as his younger brother says? Now this is a masterful story, a profound parable with so many ways to teach us. But I do think there are three points worth noting and worth holding on to today. Three points that Jesus was trying to make with this story. The first thing that we learn is that there is a new view of God that Jesus reveals in this parable. You see, Jesus tells the story to illustrate how God the Father is. Perhaps you could even say that the prodigal son is the wrong name or title for this parable. A better title would be the prodigal father, because the father is also wastefully extravagant, not with his possessions, but with his love, his forgiveness, and his compassion towards his son. That's how God is with us. Compassionate, forgiving, wastefully extravagant with his love for us. Jesus here is not saying that God is like an earthly father. He is not saying that uh, God is a patriarchal figure set up over and against woman. Jesus is saying that God our Father is a Father like no other, and we are lucky to be called His children. He loves us with an unending love. Even when we don't get it right, we are always welcomed back home. Know that this is what our Father in Heaven is like on our side, recklessly loving us, always forgiving us. The second thing we learned from the story is, I believe it reveals a new view of what sin really is like. Now it's easy to see the sinful nature and the sinful attitude of the younger son. He wasted the money, he disrespected his father, 
He lived recklessly and wastefully, all revealing his sinful heart. But it is harder to see the sin that lives inside the older brother. The older brother had always, on the outside, done the right thing. But his attitude was poor. He had hatred and anger towards his brother. He was uncompassionate. He was also in it for what he could get out of the situation. He reveals in his words and in his actions that he too doesn't have respect or even love for his father. He too was far away from the father's heart. And that, I suppose, calls us to question our own hearts and our own lives. Perhaps there is a little bit of each brother in each of us. There is a part of us that is easy to see where we sin and where we go wrong. Those outward actions that display the times that we are far away from God. But perhaps we also all need to take a closer look on the inside. To see where the sins of, of our attitudes, of our, our mind, of our thought life, of where we might not be as holy as we think we are. I reckon there's a little bit of each brother inside all of us. And it is good to acknowledge the sins that are not so easy to see that are part of us as well. Because they too help us drift further and further away from God and from the passion that He has for us. And then the third thing, and the final point, is there is a big emphasis on this story at the desire of the Father to have everyone come and join in the celebration. I love how the story ends. Both brothers are invited to be part of the father's great celebration. All the father wants is for all his children to be home with him and to celebrate all together. Isn't that a great picture of what God's deep desire is for us? He wants all of his children all of us to come home and to celebrate with him, to come and join in the celebration, to come close, not to run away from God or to live far away from him. He has shown in the story that God is seeking us out, desperate to have us near. He is looking for us. He will come and find us. He wants to include us, all of us, because there is nothing that you can do that will make him chase you away. You are loved, cherished, worthy of his blessings, forgiven, all because he loves you. And so as we consider our lives this, this week, let us remember that God is the prodigal father who refuses to give us the love we deserve, but instead who gives us the love we need. This week as we mull upon this parable, let us remember a God who waits patiently for his lost children to return. Who, when he sees us from a long way off, he runs to welcome us. Let us also remember a God who looks around the party and feels our absence. A God who leaves the party and steps outside to be with us. And who waits patiently for our response. So may you marvel at the love God has for you. May you recognize the sin in your life that needs to be addressed. And may you find the strength and the courage to come and join the celebration, the celebration of God's great love for all his children. Amen. Let us pray. And so we thank you, Lord, for this parable and for the profound truth it teaches us, that you are the prodigal father, wastefully extravagant in your love and your forgiveness of us. We are sorry, Lord, for the times that we act like the younger brother, when we are wastefully extravagant with the gifts you have given us, when we live only for ourselves and have no interest or no respect for anyone else. We are sorry, Lord, for those sins that we have committed. But we also realize, Lord, that we need to be aware of the older brother tendencies in ourselves as well. Those far more deep-seated sins, our attitudes, our mindsets, the things that govern our behavior, but also our thought life. We realize, Lord, that it is easy for us to think that we deserve your love and your goodness. 
It is easy for us to think we are better than others because we are trying harder to live well. We see, Lord, that that is just as disrespectful and unloving of you as the younger brother. So we ask for your forgiveness from those sins as well. But we also pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage we need to join the party, to come home, to celebrate with you instead of being left outside. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to draw other people into the celebration that is ongoing with you. Help us, Lord, to show more people your love and your compassion for them, to reveal your deep desire to have all your children celebrate at home with you. We thank you, Lord, that we have found a home in your love and pray, Lord, that we would derive all the benefits from living out of that love as we strive to stay connected to you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We end off our service by listening to the song Reckless Love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me And you have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me You've been so, so kind to me
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.